more than just food security you know it's cultural preserver- pres- preservation and it's uh it's just making sure that our future is secure and i think it's really important and it really exposes that in what we're going through today not only with this covid crisis but like where i'm at where we're really um struggling as a community to get through a lot of uh, destruction that just happened to us that it's really important that we have access to a lot of foods um, from community uh, around us and you know for tribal communities a lot of a lot of tribal communities have always suffered and struggled to have access to food and even access and how to deal with food so the education around that is a big part of the work that we push forward with and um, for furthering education around food access so if we have access to localized food, you know, it would solve a lot of our issues. It would help keep our food dollars within our community. It would help train our community to work and grow and harvest and preserve foods. It would give us a lot more um, uh, ability to create really healthy food pantries um, for our communities. And we would see a huge shift in health um, and really pushing away from obviously fast food and pieces like that, but people are curious. People wanna learn how to farm, people wanna learn how to cook, people wanna learn how to preserve foods. There's all sorts of pieces and we can't do it all. You know, we have to, we have to work together as a community to take chunks of that. Um, And it's also, you know, with the, with the lessons from an indigenous perspective, it's also understanding our land space and how can we really utilize it. You know, it could be difficult in a really thick urban area, but we can still plant a lot of permacultural design gardenscapes um, and orchards around. Um, And if you're outside the city, then you have a wonderful environment that you need to learn. Um, And I think we just really have to connect to the earth, connect with plants, um, and really, you know, get back to what's really important. And, you know, that's our vision of food sovereignty uh, when it comes down to it. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, Abra, Um, what does a resilient food system mean to you? I think a resilient food system for me, um, I feel really passionate about trying to connect people to their growers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fond of the statistic that, or not fond of it, I guess, but uh, well acquainted with the stat that about 100 years ago, 30% or so of our, uh, of our population were farmers, and today it's about 3%. And I think that one of the biggest um, hurdles to people caring about food is that they just don't really interact with the food system. And I think Americans as a whole are getting sort of a crash course in, um, you know, some of the issues in our food system and the consolidation and um, moving everything into, you know, giant slaughterhouses and giant meat production or, you know, not having local regional food and what that means if that system, which is incredibly efficient, but not very sustainable, what happens when that breaks down Um, and that food touches everything. So it touches, you know, every part of our lives. And, and I think for me living in a rural environment, um, you know, there's more access to land for people to have gardens and to grow food, but I don't know that it is it happens as much as when I was growing up. Um, I don't see as many gardens in my neighbor's areas. Um, And so I think people are really needing some of that authority of knowing how to do it and what to do with that food. And, you know, if you lose that, then you also lose cooking with it and, you know, the benefits of cooking together um, as a family, as a community, and it just, everything ripples out. And so for me, I'm the chef at a small Uh, organic vegetable farm and we also do a lot of grain production and so every meal that we do starts off with uh, a walking tour of our farm and and really just trying to get people to feel invested in the work that it takes to to grow this food Um, I think everybody who's on this who who grows something knows you know how hard it is to grow the very basic onions carrots and celery that are the like foundation of so many dishes and um, I think that if people really empathize with that, they will care more about food, they'll care more about its production and about the people who are behind each one of those steps. And, um, you know, right now, I feel like we're having this conversation about essential workers and, you know, what it means to be essential. And um, I think there are so many hidden faces and hands along the way. And it's great to shorten that chain. Um, Like you were saying, eggs that you can walk to get are some of the best eggs, Um, but also recognizing how many people we rely on and that those people deserve 
not just living wages, but thriving wages and respect for their work because it's all hard work. Um, so that to me is what a resilient food system is, is one where people care about it enough to understand its ins and outs and empathetically cheer for the solutions and to be able to make those pivots when things do change. Um, if it's from a pandemic or climate change or, you know, any sort of hurdle that's coming our way right now. And uh, I think we all know there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think Barbara just joined us. Barbara, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Okay, Barbara, can you hear me? Okay, I think she's still maybe getting settled. Um, so in the meantime, um, Abra, you brought up um, meat production facilities, right? And um, I've been hearing a lot in the news about how, um, I think it was Tyson Chicken, right? Who was pushing to reopen their factories and like I think a thousand workers had tested positive for COVID, right? Um, so that is a prime example of like, you know, a corporation not caring about um, their workers, right? Um, so yes. if you know who's taking care of the animals, right? Like the, the workers are gonna probably be taken better care of than the animals too. Um, sure. Could you share a little bit more about um, how a regional food system would allow um, both your Pine Ridge uh, community and the indigenous community that you're working with in Minneapolis, um, what that would mean for um, a thriving local community um, environment and food businesses, indigenous food businesses? Yeah, um, I think a lot of tribal communities uh, have the benefits of being able to write some of their own rule systems. And I think it makes them an ideal candidate to showcase what positive change can really mean by rewriting a lot of food codes um, in real time, where it could take a lot of red tape to go through a lot of policy changes on a larger scale. Um, so um, our vision is really pushing um, and trying to create access to indigenous foods, but also trying to create access to the indigenous education around foods. So we look at how tribal communities had survived before um, and basically mapping out what is an indigenous food system. So it's a large study in, in many different pieces. It's a study of uh, indigenous agriculture and farming technique and soil management and um, seed saving and it's a study in ethnobotany and wild foods and of course culinary and how food was preserved, but it's also um, all of our food is medicine. So it's a, it's a study in how we're how, remembering how all of these plants are, um, can benefit us medicinally. Um, and it's not everything else that's included, you know, it's understanding um, languages and it's understanding history and how people got to where they are today. And it's opening up, opening up the minds of the rest of, um, you know, the non-indigenous community to think about how indigenous peoples had survived in these regions for thousands of generations and the benefits that they had because of this extremely healthy diet, right? So um, we just really believe that we can get back to some of those steps. And some of this was just understanding what was lost first. So I, um, I like to relate to like when I was born in the, in the mid seventies on Pine Ridge, um, less than a hundred years, um, like my, my one, 100 years prior to my birth, my Lakota ancestors had 100% of their indigenous knowledge intact because um, they didn't discover gold in the Black Hills until 1876. And then um, as Lakota, we fought the US government um, for quite a few years up until the 1890s. Um, and, you know, it, uh, so my question was for myself, like, how did we lose so much information and what happened to all of our foods? Because when I was growing up, we just didn't have access to what was really traditionally ours, you know, with the commodity food program in my, in my shelves and in my cupboards. Um, and, you know, seeing a lot of uh, disparity and looking backwards and seeing the effect of a lot of those foods, um, what that's had and what it's still having on people today. 
you know, there's, there has to be change. Um, so we see what the benefits of having that indigenous knowledge was, was being able to understand how to utilize our environment better, um, opening up a lot more plants to be a part of our diet where the Western diet has ignored so much of the landscape around us. So really understanding the ethnobotany side of things um, and looking at the indigenous agriculture techniques, which were very organic um, and very much uh, really in tune with uh, the weather patterns, the, the, the moon cycles and all of that. Um, and understanding how, like, how much effort went into this vast amount of agriculture and seeing like how much agriculture spread throughout North America. You know, it's pretty amazing to think about corn culture starting from the bottom of Mexico, blasting both directions, north and south into the Americas and finding it way up in our regions, you know, so people having agriculture in our regions of Minnesota and Michigan for hundreds of years and how much, uh, how much they had come to understanding with, with those seeds and how these, we're still lucky that some of these seeds are still out there, you know? So we just want to really um, set up a, a system that can help bring back what was lost. And we wanna do that primarily through a lot of education. So as we're getting ready to open up our nonprofit indigenous food lab in Minneapolis to start with, it's really focused on education. It's focused on being able to teach about all those facets of indigenous food systems and teach about agriculture and ethnobotany and culinary and food preservation and medicinals and language and crafting and all those, all the above. Um, and we'll be able to have food businesses, you know, come out of that. But what we want to do is to work directly with tribal communities and help them to develop their own um, indigenous focused food system for their community. It could be a catering operation, it could be a full scale restaurant when that becomes safe to have again, but creating some access point to those communities where they have access and where their community is working on it and where they're supported so we can be a support system. We can help train anybody that wants to go through our programming to be a part of that, help develop that um, those systems to be about their region. Um, their language, their history, um, and the, you know, and make it about their food and making an evolution of their foods. Um, so our goal is working, starting here in Minneapolis, we're opening up the first phase of Indigenous Food Lab this summer, then we're going to be working with our tribal communities nearby us, and then we're going to start replicating that Indigenous Food Lab training model and opening it up in cities everywhere. So we would be in Detroit, we'd be in Chicago, we'd be in LA, we'd be in Seattle, we'd be in Albuquerque, Denver, and each one of those food lab educational centers would be a center point to work with, especially tribal communities, um, urban native communities, um, and just be a role model of what we can do um, with indigenous knowledge when it comes down to it. And just getting people, especially the non-indigenous communities, the non-people, you know, the white people that are out there to think about the land that they're standing on, to think about how America has to deal with its own history of how it became what it is, you know, off of indigenous stolen land, off of um, indigenous peoples that were stolen from Africa and forced to build what is here. And we have to address those issues. We have to go back to some of our cultural diets and we have to understand how this global indigenous community has so much untapped knowledge that can benefit us for the future and for our next generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what are some ways that um, non-Indigenous people can support that work now? Uh, there's a lot of efforts going on around um, in the communities and we're just trying to do our best to help center that and as we get open this summer, um, there's going to be a lot of great efforts and um, we've had some really beautiful Indigenous food conferences in Michigan. Um, we were at the, the um, Dewajiak community last a year ago, basically. Um, and we saw people coming in from all over North America um, celebrating this knowledge. So there's a lot of movement happening out there. Um, and, you know, we're going to be helping connect people to that and we're going to help bring in this programming and ourselves, we're going to be doing a lot of digital content so people can tap into us to have understanding, to take some of these classes directly, to um, work with us, to help teach with us if they can. Um, and we just want to share knowledge and we want to do this as a, as a larger community in general because we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to say the food at the uh, Intertribal Food Summit last year was ridiculous. It was so good. <laughs> we should have access to that kind of food all the time, you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. Definitely. Um, okay, Barbara, can you hear me? If you can hear me, um, we'd love to have you share um, what does a resilient regional food system mean to you? It looks like you're unmuted, but I can't hear you still.
Okay, I think T is going to try to help. Okay. Work it out. Um, so Abra, can you share a little bit about um, work that's going on on the west side of the state by your farm um, and what a regional food system, um, how that would allow your community and the environment uh, over there and local food businesses on the west side to thrive? Yeah, I mean, I think for us right now, we are doing a lot of work of trying to connect different growers in this region to, to share resources. And I think, you know, what you're talking about with supporting 1800 farms is just incredible. Um, and really trying to see what things are leverageable uh, as, as groups and what things need to, you know, are better suited for individual businesses to run on their own. So uh, that's kind of the business side of it is figuring out how to, you know, knit that together with the local food council movement um, that's supported by the ag extension from Michigan State. Um, there's that, but then also figuring out how to, we have a pretty broad tourist economy in this uh, specific part of the state. And so how to get people to understand that the environment that they come to for, you know, to go to the beaches or to go walking through the dunes or through Warren Woods and places like that, how that is uh, also a part of our growing system. And, you know, to get them to kind of pay attention to the food that's produced in this, in this part of the state, especially the fruit that's here. Um, you know, we benefit from the lake being right there in the moderated temperatures and so have a tremendous amount of fruit that comes uh, out, of, out of the orchards here and kind of moves not only to other parts of the state, but also to other parts of the Midwest and shipped around. So kind of what that looks like and why, you know, orchards function the way that they do, things like that. So, um, and then beyond that, in terms of that tourist economy, also there's a, uh, a big stratification between the residents that are closer to the lake and people who have either grown up here or who are further away and how to balance uh, those resources and how to um, get some of that perishable food into the hands of people who are uh, food insecure and who want to have and need to have access to, to fresh stuff and not just what's at pantries that is shelf stable or processed. And so we are working with Feed America um, has a large presence in this part of the state uh, doing their mobile pantries because transportation is often a huge issue. Um, if because, you know, this grocery store is, for me, is a 25-minute drive, um, like, of a grocery store that has, you know, a good amount of fresh produce. And so for a lot of people who, if they're homebound or if they don't have reliable transportation, how do they get that food? So what we're seeing is Feed America will come out with uh, a mobile truck, and then you'll have community members who are picking up for, you know, five to ten families and then bringing it to their community and spreading that around. So how do we get more of that food uh, into people's hands and, and higher quality, not just stuff that's donated from grocery stores after it's close to its expiration. And there's a great farm just down the road from us, Harris Family Farm Foundation, that is growing food and also is doing a lot of collection from local farms so that it's fresh produce and not, again, things that are kind of on their way out already. Um, because if someone is food insecure, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but they need higher quality food than, um, than what is often available at those pantries. So those are the kind of three things that, that come to mind initially for me. Can you hear me okay? You're, you're on mute, Lola. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so Sean, can you also share um, about how you got started in the work that you're doing? Like, What was your trajectory to where you're at today? Uh, well, I started working in restaurants at a very young age out of necessity because my mom had moved my sister and myself off the reservation when I was um, just before I was starting high school, she was going back to college. Um, and as a single parent, um, raising two kids, you know, one of them being a teenager, which was me, it's kind of a lot, <laughs> especially in the 80s. So um, I just got a job as soon as I could. So I started, I started working restaurants as soon as I turned 13. 
um, and uh, just worked all through high school and college in restaurants. And in, uh, this was in the Black Hills in South Dakota where we had a lot of uh, tourism. Um, so I worked for a lot of really busy touristy places um, growing up. And then all through college and after college, I moved to Minneapolis. Um, and because I had quite a few years of experience under me, I just kind of moved up fairly quickly. And I kind of worked my way into an executive chef position at a pretty young age in Minneapolis. And I didn't really know a lot about cooking at that time. And I didn't go to culinary school, um, but I was really good at making plates look pretty. Um, and uh, I was uh, pretty good at problem solving. Um, I guess I was comfortable with chaos, which is what restaurants are. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I just I excelled, you know, so I'd be, I had a pretty good career in restaurants. And then, you know, a few years into this restaurant was uh, world in Minneapolis, being a chef and working with many different cultures from all over the world um, and just being really curious and doing a lot of self-study since I didn't go to school for that particularly. I, um, you know, I just learned, I self-taught myself a lot. And um, I had the epiphany of doing what I'm doing just because all of a sudden I had uh, just this realization that there was um, no representation of indigenous anything in culinary. Um, I couldn't even find any cookbooks really on the subject when I started looking and there was barely any restaurants. There was, I think the Mitzitam Cafe at the Museum of the Native American in DC had just opened up, but there was no indigenous peoples working there, you know, at that restaurant. So. It was a crazy situation. So I wanted to know, you know, and I was looking for something particular, like I really wanted to know, like, what were my particular Lakota ancestors eating? Like, how were they storing food? Where were they gathering food? Um, who were they trading with? Uh, were they growing anything? Like, I want to know these questions. And as I studied, I started learning a ton about that. I started learning a ton about some of the other communities um, and nations around me, around that area. And moving back to Minnesota, I started learning a lot about the Dakota tribe here and the Anishinaabe Ojibwe tribes here um, and our friends, the Ho-Chunk and the Potawatomi. Um, and I just, you know, became a bigger picture, you know, and now we, we study all of North America when it comes down to it. And we just really, we're just really curious, but we wanted to try and make foods. The challenge was to try and make food with only indigenous ingredients of our, of our unique regions and showcase that regional food quality that we have and showcase the beauty of all this uh, regional diversity that sits around us that we ignore um, typically as Americans or Canadians, you know, and just like, you know, showcase the beauty of that. So cooking without dairy, without wheat flour, without cane sugar, without beef, pork, or chicken, not supporting those kinds of industries at all, and just showcasing what was natural around us, what, uh, looking for seeds, looking for indigenous seeds that were still alive and um, indigenous growers that were still growing them and connecting with those people. Um, so when we started the sous chef in 2014, it really just took off, you know, it was uh, filling a void that just wasn't there. And um, there's a lot of work to do and we're seeing a lot of wonderful and more creative indigenous chefs come out of this movement. Um, a lot of uh, really smart academics writing a lot and learning about a lot and sharing a lot. Um, amazing seed keepers and farmers. Um, and you know, we're, everybody's doing our best to preserve this knowledge for the future generations again, because it's not about us, it's about the future. Sean, mm -hmm. do you yeah. have, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Lola. <laughs> Um, do you have any issues with uh, regulations from health department for using wild foods if you're avoiding uh, any of the domesticated meats? Has that been a hurdle for, for your program? It really hasn't, you know, and part of the work that we are part of the way that we kind of bent the rules around that a little bit was utilizing um, some of our native farmers hereby in our region. So we have a few um, big urban farms that we work directly with here around Minneapolis. Um, one of them is called Dream of Wild Health, um, which is just north of the city. One of them is called Wojupi, which is part of the Midwakan and Dakota tribe. And what we've done is is just made uh, being able to utilize some of the the the, the plants around them, you know. So a lot of their pollinators and things like that. So we see a lot of bergamot, hyssop. Mm. We see a lot of choke cherry trees and crab apple and hazelnuts mm. and cattails. And we're able mm -hmm. to just like go out there and forage a lot of stuff. You know, and we do do some urban foraging, but we just don't really talk about that too much. Um, but we do really try to push people um, to be aware of foraging when it comes down to it. Um, and really understand that you have to understand plants before you just start taking them out of the ground. You know, you can't just go and decimate a ramp population if you don't know how that plant works. Um, so, but really I think having the partnerships with the, with the places that have land and have licensing to sell food like farms is a great place to start of utilizing some of those pieces that are just naturally around the fringe anyways. 
That's great because we have that issue with um, mostly around uh, some of the forage stuff, mushrooms primarily, and then also if we ever want to include like venison or any of the fish that's not coming through a fishery, you know, some of the bluegill or you know some of the smaller fish too. So I was just curious about that, but that's a that's an interesting. Yeah, thing. we're lucky that we have Red Lake Nation um, in the northern part of Minnesota, which has a fishery, and it's one of the mm -hmm. only fisheries in the whole U.S. that sells walleyes and northerns and things like mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. we are able to get a lot of, and, you know, part of our model is we want to purchase in food, indigenous foods from indigenous food producers. Mm -hmm. um, so we try and purchase as much as we can. So we buy all of our wild rice and maple, all the fish up there. And we're really just trying to um, create a demand. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity to become food producers, especially around these indigenous foods, you know, because people can be growing rabbits and poultry and ducks and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, and there's just going to be a lot of, a lot of need for that, but we want to support any, um, you know, indigenous food producers, but any uh, minority or, pe or person of color um, organizations out there too, because we just really want to help, you know, share this demand that we can help create um, and just give a lot of economic opportunity out there. Thank you. Um, so speaking of foraging, what are some things that you're foraging right now? Well, since we've been under quarantine, it's been a lot of stuff around my yard. <laughs> it's really funny because like uh, I have a ton of Creeping Charlie, which my neighbor hates. And he literally sits outside and picks it like strand by strand off of the lawn. So you can like, see a clear line of like my lawn to his lawn, you know. But like I'm always just picking it and putting it in salads because I know that my lawn is clean in those areas and it's fine, you know. But um, we had a really nice ramp season. There was a ton of ramps out. We've been harvesting some of the mushrooms and stuff. We have a lot of friends, so we've been able, it's a great way just to get outdoors, especially during this time period, you know. You know, and it's just after such a long winter dealing with COVID crisis, you know, people need to spend outdoors and get, you know, their hands in the soil and um, work with the plants. Um, so we just encourage people to try and do that. You know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn out there. And there's a, you know, we, we want to hopefully create more urban permaculturally designed areas too. So it's easy for people to see these plants um, in a situation that we can harvest as a community and utilize too. Thank you. And Abra, what's something that um, you're most excited to grow this year? Uh, this is, I mean, I, this time of year, asparagus for me is always one of my favorites. Um, and I finally am in a place where we're growing it. And so it's been, uh, we're on the third year now. And so it's finally starting to come up with enough gusto that we can really harvest from it, which feels, uh, so great. And there's that. And then also um, every year we've been growing these ground cherries, um, which have a really wild sort of uh, pineapple, uh, kind of almost tropical flavor to them. And they won't be out for a little bit yet, but that's one of the parts of the season that I always look forward to because it's a fruit um, that we can can grow here without having to have a full orchard without having the you know the perennial infrastructure of, of long-term fruit um, but that also is a, a different flavor from most of the things it's the only other um, fruit around here is maybe pawpaw that has sort of that kind of tropical leaf flavor to it um, so I've been really excited about those and I have a bunch of preserved ones this year so I'm uh, was just working through some of those jams and making a uh, ground cherry mustard to go with a couple of different things. So those are the things I've been been excited about. Oh, that sounds delicious. Um, you guys are so lucky to so have. So I'm the also Papas. wondering. <laughs> oh, they're amazing. Uh, yeah, we just planted a couple extra trees, and so hoping to to get them to. We've had trouble with pollination the last couple of years, so hoping to yeah. to have more of that. But yeah, we just don't get them in our zones here, so. Yeah. Um, Sean, yeah, I have a question for ice you. Cream. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, when you talk about creating the demand uh, for indigenous foods, do you have any of the issues that I think I remember reading an article and I think it's an issue with things about quinoa or some of the indigenous foods in South and Central America. And then when they become the like, super hyped super food and you know everyone goes crazy for it and then that food is all being exported are there issues with that with indigenous communities in the states that as a consumer or as a chef that would be buying those things in that i should be conscious of 
Um, I think it's really, you know, I think if we bend the story to really show the importance of purchasing these indigenous foods from indigenous communities and making sure that those dollars are going back into that effort, because there's probably going to be no way to really um, police, you know, some of these, some of these corporations getting their hands on some seeds and promoting in a very, um, you know, not great way, um, some of these ancestral foods that are out there. But I think the world has been changing. I think the, the messaging has been changing for the positive for the most part. And I think it's up to voices like we have to be able to continue to help spread those voices of the why it's really important to think about who you're, who's growing the food that you're purchasing and where it's really coming from, you know, and making sure there's that direct link because if the food has a story, it just makes it even more valuable. And, you know, so I think it's really just about that messaging when it comes down to it. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, think, and we want to see like we're, with our work, with all the training and education, we're hoping that we can help develop a lot more indigenous food production. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to see people just being able to harvest wild uh, plants to dry out for teas that we can utilize mm -hmm. or start, like I said, like raising rabbits and meats and things like that. Or the, the large mm -hmm. community gardens, if we can get more people doing that, then we can have very special um, regionally diverse uh, food production coming from uh, groups that really uh, need that economic opportunity um, and we're just going to see a lot more fun uh, flavors to play with with the foods that will be available for us so hopefully we're you know we're going to be creating an online store where people can buy a lot of foods that we're going to be kind of funneling through us from indigenous communities um, and hoping that we can not really um, drive that message out there and get people to think about that part of it. Thanks for that question, Amber. Um, and then also on that topic, um, Emily is asking the question, what are some of the things that you think um, could or need to shift to support more indigenous people being producers of their own foods? Well, a lot of it was just creating economic opportunity because a lot of tribal communities, you know, suffer from a lot of just disparity as, as do a lot of communities, even, you know, obviously inner city communities too. So it's really setting up systems that the community can work together to purchase food from, uh, that we could purchase food from them. And we want to help to develop that with them um, when it comes down to it. So um, the work that we're attempting to do is creating a system that will hopefully build that, you know, so as we get into tribal communities and help them develop food, uh, food, op uh, food operations for their community, that um, it'll also give us the opportunity to work with them to help them to develop more community gardens, help them connect them with seeds that could be particular from their areas, help them with other um, groups that can help them with permaculture design and just putting food everywhere, you know, because uh, we don't have to be wandering around foraging, looking for things. We could just be landscaping any way we want to and putting plant, healthy plants that like the soil of where they're at to grow that could be supplying us with a, with a lot more food options. Um, and there's opportunity for those communities to turn that into food production um, and be able to sell it to the greater, you know, and uh, obviously uh, um, my hopes are that they um, start to create the food pantries for their community from these foods. But um, with any excess, hopefully they can sell it outside their community and then we can help package and market and voice those stories um, to tag along with that food of why you know, this food has value and people should pay a little bit more for some of this food. So, cause that money's gonna go directly back into those communities that need it. And hopefully we can do the same thing with a lot of our inner city and urban um, efforts of agriculture that are going around out there too. Yeah, thank you. So um, Barbara is on the phone with T. So I'm gonna allow T to talk. T, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Hi, Barbara. Uh, at last, hello, everybody. How is everyone? <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. We're glad to have you here. Um, I'm glad to, to be there. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'd love to hear from you. What does a resilient regional food system uh, mean to you? Um, and what does that mean to Barbara's blueberry patch? Um, it means everyone having close access to affordable, healthy food and all kinds of food. 
And to me, it means uh, getting blueberries to everybody, getting any kind of guard, um, row crops that I grow on the side to whoever needs it. And it really means to me, I think, for people to be, to get, have all communities eating fresh, healthy food, we first got to educate the consumer. You know, fast foods and the middleman has really messed us up. We're so accustomed to the grocery store. We're so accustomed. We're addicted to sugar and salt. Uh, Some people... And some young people don't have a clue what a real fresh vegetable looks like or tastes like. And then we don't have much exposure to different cultures and different ethnic foods. So it's getting all groups of all kinds of food and all different foods from different cultures to all people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, culturally relevant foods, definitely an ever important mm-hmm. issue for sure. Um, can you also share a little bit about the history of um, the farm? You're a third generation farmer, right? Uh, I'm fourth generation farmer. I'm third generation owner. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is the 75th year uh, that my family has been on this land. It's a small 53-acre farm. Main crop now is blueberries. But growing up, we did corn. We had pigs at one point. I raised horses. Um, we've done beans, all the you know common things. But I grew up on my land knowing that he who owns the land makes the rules. I grew up eating fresh, healthy foods. And I think I'm better for it. At, I am I'll be 72 on the 12th, and I don't take any prescription medicine. Um, I'm beginning to slow down a little, but you can't tell it really. But I'm just saying <laughs> that because I think that growing up on the land made a big difference. And in this area, um, it's a diverse community. So I have access to different cultures, different kind of food. Um, I heard the gentleman talking, and I was thinking about his food because I just had my first experience in all these years. We went to a reservation. I have a cousin who worked on a reservation, and she's been nursed for eight years in Arizona, but I never got there. But I just went to the college in North Dakota, Bismarck probably, right outside, and the food they fixed us and they fixed it. It was so good. So I was just agreeing with him and like, this is when I should be talking. This is when I should be talking because the Native American food was so good and them doing so much for the community and the children and everybody was involved. So it's the same with here. Families and with the Hispanic families, we share foods. Uh, growing up, my best friend was German. We shared cultures and foods. So it's just important mixing the people with the food. I don't believe in food deserts. Amen. I I just believe that we just have to work with communities and show them if it's not anything but growing a tomato or something. Now I just got on, if you don't mind, I need to step out this door because I locked my keys in the car when I was racing to get here on time. So continue talking. Okay. Um... Thank you, Barbara. Um, so what, uh, Abra, how do we expand our palate and diversify our pantries and fridges uh, in support of a resilient regional food system? I, I mean, in some ways, I think it's by narrowing our scope. I think that we have, uh, we have, you know, endless amounts of options coming from all over the world. Um, And I think that to piggyback off of uh, what Sean was saying, you know, looking at what's around you first and, and really relying on the, the things that are from your community and in from your region and letting that dictate what you eat 
uh, I think is a way to further a resilient regional food system because then you're less, you know, it's like, uh, the only way I can think about it is, uh, you know, like avocado or whatever, or some, something that is in all of these different things that you could find online, like recipes you can find online. But if you're not growing it, or if you're not eating seasonally or regionally, you suddenly don't have that as an option. And so what can you use to replace that? Um, or what can you use that can sub in for that? And I think it's those sort of substitutions and by finding what's at hand that helps people learn how to pivot and how to riff and how to adapt. If it's a recipe or something that they think that they want to make, then that keeps you focused on what's in this area. Um, you know, so if you don't have, if it's like, say you want to make a raspberry pie, but it's not raspberry season, what else, what other fruit is coming from your area? Or what could you use jam, you know, different things like that, that you've preserved from an earlier part of the season. So I think that it's in some ways to, to really emphasize what's around us, we have to get better at using just what's immediately at hand as opposed to put energy into that as opposed into sourcing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you. Um, and and, and Sean, I'll add, what- I'll add, to that just for, I'll add to that just a second too. I think part of that sourcing and why it's more important to eat local is because then you know exactly where your food is coming from. You know, you can, you know, some of the community members growing it and you're supporting those efforts. You know, when you're buying something like an avocado, you don't know the story of how that got to your plate. You don't know the story of it's probably coming from a farm run by a cartel, <laughs> you know, and the, the workers are probably making $5 a day when it comes down to the exchange rate, you know. Um, and how much pain and effort, you know, comes from some of that money or com comes through some of that food, you know, so it's not saying don't enjoy, you know, some guacamole here and there, but it's just have, have the awareness of like the trail of where food comes from, you know, um, I think it's important for people to have those, but if you're buying local, you know, where exactly you could go and visit it, like you can go and see where it's produced and you're not wasting all that money on petroleum products to move it around. You're not wasting all those dollars on middlemen, changing, exchanging it and moving it and reselling it. You know, you're just buying it directly from your community and keeping those food dollars within your community. And plus people, you're going to create your own community flavor, you know, because it's going to be stuff from there that's gonna be unique that you're not gonna find in other regions. And that's why indigenous diets are really important because it showcases that diversity of regions. And we can, you know, we can make amazing indigenous dishes from anywhere in North America, you know, and people should be celebrating that, you know, cause America, you know, shouldn't be, American food shouldn't just be hot dogs and hamburgers, right? Or Canadian food shouldn't just be poutine. It should be like, all this diversity and we can learn from our indigenous histories and our indigenous peoples that are still out there, the foods that, the, that was part of their ancestry that really define those regions. And we can, and that grow well in those soils and those climates. And we can, you know, should be making those a big part of where, what our food, what our food diet is. Yeah, and I think to add to that, I mean, again, this comes down to the idea that, you know, food is important because it's, it's people, it affects people in on all of those fronts. And so, you know, I'm so struck by the, you know, the low income that comes from being a, a raw produce vegetable farmer, um, as opposed to somebody who creates like a package or a value added food thing. And if you're able to spend, if more of that dollar stays with the person who's growing that and stays in the community, then even if prices, you don't have necessarily the skyrocketing prices because there's fewer coming out of that to support the work that's going into growing that. And I think, you know, what we were talking about access and expanding regional and indigenous producers, I think that has to happen across the board for all food producers because we are losing farmers at a tremendous rate and the USDA has a projected uh, average loss of $1,500 for uh, the farm average income. So there's no way that even, you know, Ms. Jameson is a fourth generation farmer. So many of that next generation are looking at this and saying, I'm going to work this hard to go negative and not earn any money. And there has to be a way 
to make this a, a somewhat financially more stable career and a career that we value and a way to do that without shutting people out of access because food just becomes so expensive is to have more of that money staying in the pockets of the people who are growing it and in the communities where they are. So I think it's also about, you know, figuring out what you're supporting with those dollars, even if you're going to spend the same amount, how much of that is actually going to be worth something in that community. And if you want to see that change. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring Barbara yes. back on. Barbara? Can you hear me? Okay, yes. I, yes, thank you. I'd like to say two things first. Besides okay. buying or eating local, it's important to eat what grows in your area in season. You know, when the, if you live in a climate like we do, when the winter comes, there's winter food and vegetables, and sometimes that would be the substitute for the avocado. There are a lot of root vegetables that taste really good and you're probably not even aware of them. So that's one thing. And then the other thing, the reason, the other thing is the reason that all this stuff that you buy costs so much because of the middleman, and that's where the farmers are losing out. See, I was taught farming is a business. Most small farmers or farmers of color don't have a business plan for one, and you don't do your marketing. If whatever you're growing and however many crops it is, if you haven't got a market and you're depending on somebody with a, in a food hub or some processors to set the price for you, you'll never make any money. If I know it costs me 75 cents to produce a pound of blueberries, it's no way I'm going to sell it to you for 50 cents because I've done my business plan and I know what it costs. So if I only want to make a quarter on my pound, then I'll sell it for a dollar. But what if I want to make 50 cents? Then my berries have to be a dollar fifty. But I and I definitely have to have 100 percent with my berries. Even my U pink. So if it costs me a dollar to produce a pound, no matter what I have to do to get that pound, then I must sell my berries for two dollars or more. But most farmers grow crops small or large. You're not managing your risk. And it's five major risks. So when the farmers start doing their homework and marketing is one of the major risks. So I don't care, everybody can grow. I don't care what you grow, whether it's culturally good or whether it's a specialty crop or whatever. If you don't do your marketing, you're not going to make money. And that's simple as that. You know, everybody's saying now a lot of people jumped to the blueberries, thought it was blue gold, but they didn't do the marketing. They didn't, first, they didn't manage their risk and they didn't do a business plan. Um they just started producing. Well, if everybody around you is producing and you not you don't have a market, then you know, you're gonna have to take what somebody else tells you that they're gonna give you. That's not me. So everybody should look at the risk. Mm -hmm. And this is USDA and that's the USDA is good for a lot of things and they have a lot of uh, agencies that do a lot of education. Risk management is the agency that manages risk, and they've got all kind of literature. I have some risk management books on introductions to risk management, and if you deal with the five risks, some people uh, working on farm job, they decide, oh, well, I want to grow something, but they don't look at the human factor. They don't know who's going to help them. They don't know if their family's going to help, whatever. You know, you just have to manage your risk. And uh, marketing is the most important myth. I don't, I don't use middlemen like that. Because mm -hmm. why should I grow these berries? And then I've got to pay you for transporting. I've got to pay somebody else to sell, take them and sell them. No. So that's where your problem is. And I mm -hmm. love for people to work on their risk. So those are, that's my spiel. Barbara, can you share a bit about um, what you uh, have been doing since 
COVID. Um, I think you were sharing about doing food boxes for folks, right? Uh, yeah, we do. We get uh, food boxes. We've had dairy. Uh, Friday, I had one that was vegetables. I don't know where they came from. It came from that government thing doing food. So our community is real small, real diverse. We have no red lights, no railroad tracks, no tall buildings. And you pretty much know everybody, but I've been passing out here. I keep masks in my car and gloves. And I try to help any and everybody. But even in season when it's not a pandemic, I glean from some of the big farmers and I always give out fruits and vegetables because I've always been blessed to have more than enough. I don't have a problem with anybody coming to my farm if they want some blueberries. Because mm -hmm. no farmer does all their yield, and I can share with the birds or whatever. So, um, but during the pandemic, I've been doing masks and gloves and helping to giving out food to the community. That's great. Um, so we're gonna move into question and answer section. So we're gonna field some questions from um, folks who are on the webinar. So Irma, who we're actually gonna hear from um later who is working with the sierra club um she's asking uh what challenge are you facing um or do you face regionally in terms of water and water access and uh water quality um abra would you like to respond to that i right now we have too much water. Uh, we have had so much rain the last two years. We've had incredibly wet springs and incredibly wet falls and a lot of snow in the winter. And so, and we have a heavier soil in this area. So a lot of clay. And so we've been faced with a lot of flooding. Um, so our issues are, are different probably than, than other people in other areas. Um, and so we're just trying to manage diverting that water right now through um, more water loving plants and a larger uh, windrow barriers and then diverting it into some of the drainage fields and in, in the area. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Barbara, did you also want to address that water uh, access and water quality over in Covert? Okay. Um, I really wasn't paying attention. This gentleman just got me my keys and I was signing this receipt. I heard oh. something about water, but um, I'm sorry. You guys probably going to have to have another uh, meeting, Zoom meeting, so I could be completely attentive and have all my answers. Okay, well, I'm glad what you got here. Your... Um, so, Irma is wondering um, what challenges uh, do you face in terms of uh, water access and water quality? Um, well, in my farming career, the our water table has changed drastically, yes. So, for that, like, when I was younger and planning or whatever, I do a lot of, it depends on, I have to depend on the season and the weather. So if we have a, and I do a lot of, I do all my pruning and stuff in the fall, or if I'm planting, I plant in the fall. So when they go to sleep and the snow in the winter, when they wake up, they'll have, you know, some water for a while because I don't have irrigation. And then on a really, really dry season, the, you know, that takes toll on the weight of my berries because the rain makes them bigger and plumper. And I just have to play with the weather, but I've always been blessed to have a nice season. But some of the really dry seasons, a few years back here, I don't know if anybody's in southwestern Michigan, but a few years back, maybe four or five, it was extremely dry, and some fields was just completely brown. A lot of people lost a lot of bushes. There's nothing you could do about that when it happens, unless you have irrigation, and I don't. So that is a challenge, but it doesn't really... I didn't lose hardly any bushes that year, but... Um, some years I wish for more water, 
And, you know, then some years we have too much. <laughs> so I don't really have an answer for that because I am, you know, it's natural. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. I, I, um, so Tanya is wondering about worker owned and community based business models. Um, Sean, would you like to? Yeah. Um, that's something that we've thought about a lot um, and we really hope that we can make it a reality because um, we really believe that um, these community-based food systems need to be um, need to be a wave in the future like especially this post-COVID situation you know um, with all this um, giant food uh, all these giant food businesses as, um, that we rely on as communities you know are struggling to maintain their status quo of you know, housing all these people in factories to get this product out there. So it's more important to have these these food business situations. But as anybody would know, food businesses are extremely hard to maintain. Um, they're um, they're very chaotic, and there's, there's just a lot of issues. There's a lot of problem solving that comes with it. So they're very difficult. You know, it's easy to think of a, of a cool restaurant name and what you want to serve, but when you get down to the nitty gritty of like dealing with rent and all of your bills and your payroll and then all of your employees and all of their bad days and all of the stuff you know it's a lot of it's a lot right and anything can go wrong mechanic mechanical things can break down all this stuff can happen so all we're trying to do is create a support system for food businesses so if we can train people how to do this kind of food help them develop commercial kitchens to prepare this food um, create uh, uh, enough demand so they can be helping the farmers and growers around them by being able to purchase a lot more food from them. Like those are all win-wins. And if we can get the community to set up a cooperative model where they can have a lot of youth helping out with the foods to supply the community um, and just maintaining those kinds of things. And we can ha- always, like our model will always be there for training and support, you know? And we see that because um, I always use my friend Valerie Seagrest's model out in Seattle where she um, worked with, uh, she works with her tribe, um, which is the Muckleshoot tribe just south of Seattle. And she um, is uh, kind of an expert on ethnobotany and wild foods and medicinals. And she has a program where she trained her kids um, on medicinals. So they go out, they harvest all this beautiful food around them and they, um, they, pr- they, they process it into things like teas and salves and rubs and Um, all sorts of stuff. And they've created an entire community medicine cabinet out of all this natural um, ancestral medicine that's free for their entire community to come and get any time. So it's just a really cool way to think about how something so simple you can give back. And we can do the same way with food. If people just chipped in, if you did volunteer work, you can make food just for the community, you know. But if we want to create food producers and create that opportunity, then we just have to um, think of systems where it becomes a program, you know, because um, as we're getting ready to launch Indigenous Food Lab, one of the pieces that we're going to have is an Indigenous tea um, counter for people to just purchase a lot of um, flavors, kind of barista style. And we're going to be able to work with a lot of our partners and friends around the nation to purchase a lot of just dried plant product, you know. So we're hoping that we can work with a lot of youth proje- uh, projects that can just help um, uh, they can use it as a teaching uh, situation where they can go out and learn how to identify and harvest and then process and they can sell it to us because we'll have a demand there for it. Um, so it's, as we move post COVID, we have to think about like what's really important, you know, and fast food restaurants are import- aren't important, you know, and where our food comes from is important and we need to be supporting those local producers like we've been talking about, you know, and we don't, you know, if you're going out to get, uh, you know, a hamburger or some fried chicken or some pizza, you have to think about like, where are they getting their food? Is it just coming from a big box truck? You know, is it just coming straight out of uh, the Cisco's and US Foods and Reinhardt's and all those kinds of food services? You know, because that's not going to help anybody. Like as, for us, you know, as chefs and as, uh, as food producers ourselves, we just made the conscious decision to only serve healthy foods to the communities and to the people that buy the food from us, you know, and that's unapologetically it has to be the wave of the future. Like we have to think about health because all this fast food, all this processed food, it's part of this problem. It's part of the problem why um, COVID is hitting us so hard because we're not healthy, you know, and we need to move past that and we need to get our kids to be healthy. Um, and we need to help show them the way. Yeah, thank you so much. 
Um, so Abra Ashley is asking, uh, she says, it sounds like you preserve a significant share of your harvest to use at different times of the year. Is that right? What are some of your favorite things to preserve and or preservation methods? Uh, yeah, I think one of the things I'm the most proud of at Greener, the farm where I work, is that the meal program and now this uh, food that we sell through the farm store is a great way for us to absorb the overage. So if we're, you know, when it gets to be tomato and eggplant season, there's always uh, people wanting tomatoes until Labor Day. And then everybody seems to go away and they want Brussels sprouts, but that's when all the tomatoes are here. Uh, so, <laughs> so I get to, to take all of that overage and turn it into um, either sauces that we can can or freeze. Um, we do a lot of dehydrating and jams. Um, some fermenting. Uh, I did a whole batch of fermented green beans uh, this last summer and, and different things like that that we can then uh, can use up at different times. And um, I think that it's it always feels a little bit funny to put that food on the menu in the middle of winter, like to have a tomato eggplant ragu or something in the middle of winter in the spring when that food isn't growing. But I think it's to get back to what Barbara was saying about, you know, there are winter foods and, you know, to have an entire, you know, seven course menu that's based around the things that are available right then and then to get this one bright hit of summer that still came from that same piece of land is a really nice part of the programming that we do. And it makes a nice foil to some of like the sweetness of the parsnips and the squash and, and stuff like that. But uh to get back to the actual question, uh, I guess we do a lot of, yeah, uh, canning, freezing, jamming, fermenting, stuff like that, dehydrating. Nice. Thank you. Um, so Grace is wondering, um, how do you think that our current subsidy system could be shifted to, to support small growers? Abra, would you like to address that? Uh, I'm not as well versed in the ins and outs of the subsidy system as they should be because uh, we, our farm doesn't generally apply for them. Um, my understanding is that there are seven kind of big crops that receive most of the subsidies. It's, um, and, and somebody else jump in if I've got it wrong, but I think it's uh, corn, soy, wheat, rice, cotton, uh, there's got to be two more that I'm just blanking on. And so I think that um, one of the things that we saw in the most recent food bill and Senator Stabenow has really been leading a lot of the, um, the sort of changes in that farm bill uh, is that now um, smaller producers or people who don't grow those seven things can also apply for crop insurance um, for some of those things. So I think that a way that the subsidy, and again, I'm a little bit out of my lane on this. So um, this is just personal opinion, not actual policy. Um, and somebody else I'm sure is better, better to answer it, um, is that if we start to demand that farmers that are growing a diverse array of ingredients and crops be able to apply for some of that same insurance. I think that that would go a long way. And I think it comes back to some of those financial incentives for people to grow other things. Um, you know, like my cousins, I grew up on a pickle farm. So we grew pickling cucumbers that we sold to Heinz. And then my cousins have now taken over um, that business and are have transitioned through a bunch of different things and now primarily grow non GMO corn and edible black beans and I uh, you know, they took on the edible black beans as sort of a risk because it's not something that's easy to apply for that insurance for and I think if there were some of those supports, not only for people who are growing to grow crops, but people who you know, are in lots of different size scales of farming, but who could face some of the same issues in terms of flooding or crop failure, or, you know, whatever it might be. I think that would help give a safety net for more people to, to feel confident growing more things. I don't know, again. Yep. Yeah. I can say a couple pieces just because, you know, for me, I grew up on the commodity food program. You know, so most people would know that as just the basic staples that you would see in any school system or um, hospitals or uh, um, churches, for example, or even military when it comes down to it. But, um, you know, this, uh, the FDPIR um, program and the commodity food program, um, which um, serves all these pantry items to tribes, 
you know, it's been really damaging to us as indigenous communities for quite a while. And we have really strong evidence of what happens to entire communities when their entire um, food and nutrition is coming from this program of overprocessed foods um, that's high in salts and sodiums, of course, high in bad sugars and bad fats. Um, and just, you know, just the basic over, it's really hard to make anything healthy out of that batch of food. And it's food, like we're happy, to, people are happy to have it, but it's obviously the majority of it is just not good for you when it comes down to it. So I think that, that those programs need to shift on not only serving less overprocessed foods, but also breaking up regionally access foods by finding out like who can, who can like, like what are the slots that we need? You know, you need your starches, you need um, maybe some of the dairy and stuff like that, but how do you break it up into re smaller regions so you can redistribute it in those regions? Cause that would keep the food dollars there, you know? So looking at how it's done for the tribal communities, you know, um, they've been trying hard to put indigenous food items um, and options on the list of things. So for example, they added wild rice a couple of years ago to the list um, and were able to purchase a ton of wild rice from uh, Wide Earth Tribe Reservation in Minnesota, um, which they put into the program. But the problem with that, um, to be able to have that kind of demand for from them is a huge ask, you know, because it's an immense amount of food to be able to supply an entire nation of people um, that are on that program. So what it did was basically it ran out their supplies immediately and they had to buy wild rice from other tribes, making it more scarce in, the, in their own community. And then shipping it around the nation, like people don't know what to do with wild rice in the Southwest or the Southeast or even the East Coast because it's not from there, you know, it's not their foods. So I think it's just a great example. And plus like the tribal communities, like for example, um, elders in those communities could buy wild rice for $2 a pound up until that happened. And then everything jumped up because of that demand last year. And now the elders are forced to pay $8 a pound, which was four times the price in one single year, you know? Um, and it's just really, you have to think about the effects of all those pieces. You can't tap one community or one piece like that. And if you did it regionally, then you would just be distributing the food in those areas. Um, and that's really how it needs to change, you know? Because again, it's all about food dollars and moving the food around less and all the money that it takes. Like just think how much money you would save just in shipping alone um, on, mm -hmm. on, on a national scale. Um, but then all that money can go back into purchasing more food and healthier food when it comes down to it. So those programs need to completely change because when they started those commodity food programs, mm -hmm. they were, it was after the last Great Depression in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And it was there to support a lot of poor families that were out there. And also to create, um, you know, sub surplus of foods for hospitals, school systems, military, and the tribal communities that they had these um, um, these deals with, basically. But uh, over time and during the industrialization of our food systems, we saw um, uh, that change because originally uh, those uh, the U.S. was purchasing those foods from small farmers and small producers to supply that. But then it changed to all those food dollars going directly into corporate pockets, you know. So all the big Heinz car corporations and things like that are the ones that are getting those contracts to supply those foods so it, all those all those dollars are just going into corporate pockets and going into lobbying money basically when it comes down to it so we have to break it up into regions and we have to be able to it'll help support our food systems it'll help create regional food systems that way too because there's gonna be a lot of families in need that are going to be relying on that for a long time thank you I also think to um, piggyback on that, um, mm -hmm. that I think one of the interesting things that could come out of, um, you know, the current moment that we're in and also with some of the health stuff is to think about if there are more creative programs than just the subsidies and saying like, you know, can people start getting a discount on their insurance premiums if they are members of a CSA or if they have a, you know, plot in a community garden or something like that. I think that those links between you know, food and medicine and health are, are tightening. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for that. And I don't, I don't know where any of that legislation is, but I think that there's lots of different ways that our, if, if policy is our values, how do we have our values reflected more accurately in that policy? And I think there's a lot of opportunity for creative solutions there. I'm sorry to interrupt, Lola. No, you're good, thank you. Um, so, Irma, I'm going to um, allow you to talk. 
um, if you could, and I'm going to ask you to unmute um, so that you can share with us a little bit about your work. Can you hear me okay? I can. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, to wrap up, if you can uh, share a little bit about what are, from your perspective and your work with the Sierra Club, um, what are some of the biggest challenges that we're currently facing um, as we're working towards a more resilient um, regional food system? Um, and how can a resilient regional food system support our environment? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> I work with the, um, in, the, in Michigan, with the Michigan chapter of the Sierra Club and their Great Lakes program. And my focus is more so on protecting water quality uh, here in our, in our watershed. So that was why I asked the question about what were the challenges in terms of water access. Um, what we know is that ag agriculture, you know, globally is the largest user of water. And we also know that there are now many places that are facing water scarcity because of climate change. So um, the, in terms of resiliency, <laughs> we have to have uh, access to water. We, we cannot grow without it. Um, and that water needs to be of uh, sufficient quality. And so it's, it's kind of this um, where ag needs the water, but ag also uh, typically larger agricultural producers um, also are some of their practices are challenges to water quality. So the runoff from farms, for example, uh, when there is excess nutrient runoff, nitrogen and especially phosphorus, then that phosphorus, like in the case of the Western Basin of Lake Erie, can create harmful algal blooms. And those harmful algal blooms are detrimental to the health of, of a water body. And we're seeing that at one point, uh, this was just happening in a few places, but now these toxic blooms are occurring in multiple water sources. Um, so a, a, a regional system, uh, smaller systems, you know, are important because you know, it makes us more nimble. You know, we're able to deal with some of these challenges, um, but yet we do have to think about these connections, important connections of land and water and food systems. So um, I, I was also asked uh, by Ashley to, to talk a little bit about resources. So I wanted to do that. I noticed on, uh, in the queue, in the chat, that there were representatives here from the uh, Food Lab, uh, which is here in Detroit, Food Lab Detroit, but I think there are other food labs in other places as, as resources. Uh, the Michigan Food Policy Council. Um, if anyone's like interested in just reading more about resiliency, I would highly recommend uh, that they reference um, Michigan State University's Center for Regional Food Systems. Uh, professor Mike Ham. Uh, there is the professor of sustainable agriculture and I think would be an excellent resource uh, to, to learn more about this. Um, and there's also um, uh, a course. I can put that in the chat. It's resilience.org forward slash food dash system dash lessons. And then uh, the organization that I'm also attached to, Healing Our Waters, Great Lakes Coalition, is a coalition of uh, 160 plus organizations in the eight Great Lakes states and two Canadian provinces that are within the Great Lakes watershed that I think, um, you, know, I you know, we welcome uh, other organizations who are interested uh, in water protection, one of the policies that we often are involved with um, maybe commenting on is the farm bill. Um, so I think it was uh, Sean that might have mentioned, or maybe Abra, that mentioned uh, we were talking about policies and these connections and subsidies and that kind of thing. 
And I think it's the farm bill where we have the opportunity to comment or to come together as a coalition to provide comments and try to influence the policies that are within the farm bill. So um, I'll type here in the chat, Healing Our Waters uh, Great Lakes Coalition, if anyone is interested. Um, so that's what I wanted to share. Thank you so much. We really You're appreciate welcome. you being here with us. Um, Abra or Sean, would you like to respond to um, what Irma shared? Or did you have any? Um... Um, you know, uh, I can say quick, I know we're kind of creeping up on our time, but um, yeah, I think, you know, water is going to be an enormous issue for us in the future. And we're going to have to figure out as a whole, as a nation, how to adapt, you know, because yeah. I grew up in southern South Dakota. Um, where we tapped directly into the Oglala Aquifer, which yes. is a massive body of water that stretches, you know, like almost down to the Texas, you know, and it's been just getting sucked up, you know, through industrial agriculture and just like, you know, jerks like Nestle when it comes down to it, right? But, you know, we're losing a lot of it and that whole area, we're going to go through really intense water shortages, especially with climate change happening. And, you know, we're going to have to work together um, to really figure it out and how to, um, you know, really be careful because, you know, the worst sign was quite a few years ago when all the corporations started buying up all the water rights, you know, that was not going to be a good, not, it's not going to end well. Um, but we have to help change things, you know, we have to work together to do what's right. Um, and water is a human necessity and we need it um, and we need to have control over it. Because um, if people control our water sources, there's no power for us, you know, there's nothing we can do. So I just hope that our, we set things up so our future generations can have a really strong voice um, and our immediate future generations at that um, to be able to work towards, you know, really holding on to the power of being able to regulate water when it comes down to it. Yeah, absolutely. Water well said. is... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so we are at seven o'clock. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, thank you, Abra. Thank you, Irma, Barbara, and Sean uh, for sharing your thoughts. And thanks to T, who's kind of been helping um, helping with the chat box too. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email, just lola at keepgrowingdetroit.org, or you can also email info at keepgrowingdetroit.org. Um, I hope you guys are staying safe and we hope to see you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Sean, I have a quick question for you if you have a second. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I am looking for, so I'm in the process of writing a grains and legumes cookbook and sure, nice. wanted to um, feature different producers because I have any of those things. And so kind of, again, getting back to that idea of uh, trying to connect people to how that food is produced. Um, would you... Do you, would you want uh, a grower, a uh, wild rice producer to be featured? Is there another grain? Is there a way that I could use that platform to give voice to some of the work that you're doing? Yeah, just shoot me an email with what your ask is and I can help point you in the right directions easily, so. Great, what's yeah. the best email for you? So uh, Sean at sue-chef.com, so S-E-A-N at S-I-O-U-X dash chef.com. All right, perfect. Yeah. Thanks and we that. should all be shared on this Zoom meeting too, so we should okay. all see it. Yeah. All right, great. Thanks so much. And again, hope that you guys are staying safe. And Lola, thanks again so much for including me in this. I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much to all you guys. I've learned a lot. Thank you. All right. All right, well, I'm going to jump. Thank you, guys. Talk again. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.